Okay, so, oh, can I not have people in the front here? Can you guys sit over at the side because we're filming? All right, so uh, today we're doing the parasite. We're doing the parasite lecture, um, and uh, two little short, one short video and one medium video. Uh, the, the videos that we're seeing will be on the test, of course. That's why we're having. And they go in your lab record book, front to back, uh, with an asterisk, with the date and title. Uh, one of them is called African Sleeping Sickness, A Cure Not Used. And the other one is Conquest of the Parasites. And it covers everything that's on your parasite test. So it's extremely important. Um, so we're going to be doing that in lecture today. Then the next class is... <laughs> Next class is point day, meaning there's a lot of points coming in all at once. Uh, your typed formal unknown paper report is going to be put on my desk along with your bonus parasite uh, typed up however way you want to do it on cards as an uh, outline or one person's even going to do it as a chart. So any way you want to turn it in for the 25 bonus class points please do. Remember that's the last 25 of 100 in the class called class-wide bonus points. And if you don't have them done, you don't get them. When you turn them in, be very sure that when you turn in the typed unknown formal report and your parasite bonus, that when you finish your test, you pick both of them up before you leave because you're going to need to study for the final using the parasite bonus and you're going to need to correct your paper. And so you're going to come in and you're going to take bring out a Scantron 884, not an 882, an 884. Did everybody hear me say 884? Mm -hmm. This morning six people showed up with an 882. Just the big one, right? Yeah, the big one. And I had three, so that meant three of them uh, had to sit there and wait for the bookstore open at 10 and they got a much less time to do their test because they didn't have a Scantron. So every day I've been putting up the Scantron number and somehow people are not picking up on that. So while you take the test, I'll be grading your paper. Uh, I will put comments on the title page. Uh, today uh, we had a couple of things like people not typing the reference page right. You know, they were formatting errors. You know, like the abstract um, type in a regular without it being justified and blocked in and all of that. Uh, the only serious error we had, we had two people cheat, which got them zeros, which means they're going to flunk the class. Uh, one of them said we did a peptone iron D. We didn't do it. One of them said we did an SS auger plate. We didn't do that this term, which means they were copying someone else's paper. Hold on, a peptone iron D business stab in the That's Clickers iron. That's Clicker's iron. Peptone iron deep is just a beige auger that we used to make that we stabbed. So oh, that's we did KIA. We did Clicker's right. iron auger. But, is, so what if we just make an honest mistake? Because sometimes, you know, we were doing the paper today, we were like, yeah, yeah we did that, right? Yeah, I thought did. it was the stick yeah. in the auger. Yeah. That's, that's what, what I thought it was. If, if, I mean, you know, we only get tested over it three times, and you kind of should know what test we're doing. But if I mean, you know, I'm not going. I'm going to ask you. I'm going to say, where did you get this? Because yeah. they listed KIA, and right. then they listed peptone iron stab D, and then they asked, listed SS auger. We haven't talked I about SS auger ever. That, I knew we didn't do that. So, um, and then the other was not a serious problem, but it was, and that is, they did. They didn't have consistent lactose results. In other words, on their, in the like ninth edition, it says glucose positive, glucose and lactose positive. So they put phenol red glucose positive and phenol red lactose positive, but they didn't put the lactose in litmus milk, the lactose in Quigger's iron, the lactose in ONPG, the lactose in all the other tests, EMB, uh, McConkie's, and hectoin. They didn't list that. They're all lactose tests, so they all have the same reference result. Everybody get that? Mm -hmm. Even though we didn't do litmus. 
Oh, you didn't do what? We didn't know the whole. Yeah. 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 <laughs> what about the lines? Like, you know, red kept coming up. Well, you put whatever you get. Okay. But the reference is not going to change. The reference book. If the reference book says it's positive for a lactose test, that means every one of our lactose tests should be positive in that reference, not your results, but the reference. Right. Yeah. How do we reference like what you said? Like, you know, it's not a book or anything. So how do we actually reference there, it? Like, there's a way. Uh, you just do Hicks, comma, Donald Dar, uh, personal communication during class on the third of August. Yeah. Oh, okay. We can do it that way. Yeah. In the day. Okay. Like a couple of you, the <laughs> the VP uh, somehow they got thrown away, and so I had to tell you what your VP was. So you write down what I told you, and then you say, put an asterisk there, uh, uh, you know, this was provided by the instructor because our tests were lost, or something like that. You know, I think they got thrown away or something, yeah. Um, on the abstract portion of the, the paper, on the tests that do test lactose, such as the ONPG and the hydroin, do you want us to just put like ONPG positive or ONPG lactose positive? Delayed lactose positive. In other words, when you're making out your data table for hectoin, oops, geez, learn to write. Okay. So here you have hectoin. And under it, you have hectoin lactose, and you have hectoin H2S, and you have hectoin uh, color on color of growth on auger. All of those are three results that everybody should have for their hectoin. Uh, your McConkie, did we do McConkie's? What did we do uh, other lactose? We did ONPG, so that's called delayed lactose. Uh, what else did we do? Other lactose results? Yeah, oh yeah. KIA. So you're going to do KIA glucose, KIA lactose, and KIA hydrogen sulfide. So there's not going to be anything here because there is no one result for those. They are a, you know, I wouldn't even put the H there. I should say lactose and hydrogen sulfide color of growth. Yes, for the data table. Out. And remember, when you use, did we do spirit blue? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so spirit blue. Remember in parentheses it goes lipase. And starch auger. In parentheses is amylase. And what was the other one? Uh, skim milk. And milk auger. In parentheses is KCAs. Because that's what it's going to be printed, particularly in the ninth. It's going to be listed this. It's not going to be listed by these names. It's going to be listed by the enzyme. Okay. So, yeah. Um, for um, quoting internet sites and text, do you have to do that? Or if you, if you just do the reference or quiz? Because I, I have a couple things from the internet that I've read. Well, I mean, you put the author's last name and the date published, and then in, on the reference page, you put author's last name, date published, uh, I mean, date accessed, hour accessed, and then the web address. Right, I know how to do it on the reference page, but in text, I want to In text, sure. same way. Okay. Uh, if you're quoting something from mine, it would be Hicks, 2013. Okay, so author's last name and you said date. Hicks, date. Date you accessed. Or the okay. year you access it. All right, so uh, let's keep going here. Uh, on 6-3 Monday, I have an appointment out of town, so you're going to be studying for your final. That's what you're officially going to be doing, and I am officially going to be emailing your last grade sheet, and it will include the test, the Unit 3 test, and your paper grade on it. And any stuff that I, you know, I do have like five tests that I haven't done the corrections on that people gave me back. All of that should be updated on that if it isn't emailing back. On the 10th is our final exam. We start at 5.30.
and it's uh, it's supposed to be two hours, but I will give you longer, something like 5.30 to 8 o'clock or something like that. And it's going to be 200 multiple choice questions. That's it. And the questions will be one half of this test that you're going to have next on Unit 3, acellular parasites and uh, eukaryotic parasites. Then there's going to be 196 questions. I mean, hold it. There's 100 questions from Unit 3, 96 questions from Lab Practical 2 midterm, and four questions from Lab Practical 1 no photos. Uh, then you bring me your final exam packet. Inside the packet is your assigned last grade sheet that you got, your lab record book, and if you were a checker, that should be signed. If you put the ages bonus in it, that should be just below where I signed your lab record book, stapled or glued or taped in. Any, um, your formal unknown report with the corrections already done and my comment page stapled to the top of it. Your final exam bonus paper, which is one and a half to two pages typed from either AIDS denialist or and the band played on summary. And any one grade where I took off points because you couldn't didn't know your last name from your first name or you didn't know what class you were in or you wrote on the back or you, you know, all those little secretarial errors. Anyone have any questions about what's coming up? Okay, so today we're doing your friend and mine, things that make you want to vomit, parasites. And they are going to be so exciting. I hope nobody ate. If you ate, I hope you ate a long time ago because it's going to be really nasty. Yeah, you're going to bomb it with throw up. I would rather have it like this. Is that all right? Yeah. I'm going to open the door. And it's okay, so we're going to... I hope it's good. Last night it didn't record. That's why I'm freaking out. I did this whole lecture and thinking I was getting a nice little video of it so everybody could look at it ahead of time or something. And it didn't record last night. The memory card was full or ruined or damaged or something. So I'm hoping it's working today. All right, so anyway, we're going to go through the major parasites. Uh, and we're going to start off with what we call, remember, we want you to know the taxonomic classification of these. And the ones we're going to study, remember there are more parasites, eukaryotic parasites, than stars in the sky times 10, viewed from Palm Springs on a clear night. And uh, there's almost as many viruses. So there, there is no way that we can even do a representative sample of eukaryotic parasites. So what we're going to do is we, we selected what they call the five great neglected classes of parasites of mankind. And so it's the five classes that we're going to be going over. And these are called great because millions of people die every year still of these diseases. And they're called neglected because they are neglected by the individual countries. They're neglected by the pharmaceutical corporations. They're neglected by the World Health Organization, and they're neglected by scientists. Can anyone tell me why they're neglected by everybody? What fuels cures? No money Treatment. involved? Money. That's right. These are diseases of the tropics. Name a rich tropical country. 500 bucks for one rich tropical country. There aren't any. So. If you make an average of $1,100 a year is your total wage, can you afford a $600 vaccine? No. So uh, there is no profitability in the parasites. And that's supposedly supposed to be your big charge. My job was to supposedly excite you about parasites. And some of you are going to be, find a brilliant way to making researching and curing parasites profitable. And there are things that no one ever thought was profitable before, remember. Just uh, 
what was it, two years ago, a man in Bangladesh got the Nobel Prize for $25 loans. Many of the little home businesses needed $25 to $50 to $75 just to get started in India and Bangladesh and Pakistan. And they would go to money lenders that would charge them 1,500% so that once they borrowed $75, the rest of their lives, they would be paying it back. And this man put together what they call the mini lending banks. And it's not M-A-N-Y, it's M-I-N-I, -I, where he would loan 75 to like less than $500 to start this and give them a reasonable return so he made a profit and they wouldn't be owing money the rest of their lives and nobody said that could be done so there are ways that brilliant people can figure out to do things uh, another one that uh, I was a member of and I can't remember the name of the organization but it is an organization that allows people that are retired or near retirement that have savings to put up money for venture startups, for people that have brilliant ideas but can't get money from the bank. And uh, they put up a business plan and uh, it's examined by professionals to see if it's a valid bus business plan. And then we buy basically a little stock in their uh, company and they're able to buy us out once they make profit. And so 10 people putting together uh, you know, $2,000 a piece could start a small company. And so there are people that have brilliant ideas that were once, you know, thought to be impossible. So anyway, your job is to come up with something to make studying and researching either prevention, treatment, or, or cure of parasitic diseases. All right, so we're going to start off with the taxonomic classification of the first major class of diseases and you notice is where they affect in the world. These are what we call the filarial diseases. They are microscopic tissue roundworms. So they're in the animal kingdom, they're in the helminthic phylum, which is the worms, and they are the filarial diseases. These are all filarial. They are all microscopic tissue roundworms. And the first one has two different causes. It's called, the common name is elephantiasis, or big leg. It's what it's common name. And it's caused by two parasites. Uh, one is predominantly in Africa and the Near East, well, India. And it's Wuscheria bancrofti. And then there's one that is in Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Thailand, and Malaya. And this is Brugia malayi. They both cause elephantiasis. One is just a predominantly in one area and one in the other. And big leg is a disease that is characterized by this edema and swelling. This is probably the most every teenager in history has looked in encyclopedia and found the man carrying his testicles in a wheelbarrow. So of course this is the most famous picture is back from way back in the 1900s of someone with elephantiasis. Usually it affects the legs and the lower extremities and it this uh, elephantiasis is now spread around the world from Central America, Northern Brazil, a few islands in the Caribbean, most of Sub-Saharan Africa, and the uh, Near and Far East. Um, the common name is filariasis or big leg, and uh, the if you want to talk about all of them that are together, remember filariasis is all of these diseases, big leg and elephantiasis is this one with two causes. All right, so we're going to talk about it and the life cycle. It's carried by biting mosquitoes, uh, various different kinds of biting mosquitoes. 
Uh, if you go into these areas of the world and you get bitten, you're not going to get elephantiasis. First of all, you have to be bitten over a number of years. We're talking 25, 30 years of being constantly bitten by mosquitoes that spread it. And then, even then, there's only a small percentage of people that develop the elephantiasis. We don't know the reason for that. We don't know why it's somewhere like uh, 10 to 25 percent of the people that get consistently bitten over 20 years develop elephantiasis, and other people never do. Big leg, Thus, big leg is first of the two types, W. Bancroft and Rugia Malaya. Right. And These are both big leg. And the hilarious also includes the Armstrong Right. So the types of mosquitoes that carry elephantiasis or big leg is the Aedes, Culex, Anopheles, and Mansoni. All right, so let's talk about the host, the alternative host. And remember, let's get our terms down. The word alternate host and intermediate host is the same thing. And it means where the microbe ha has asexual reproduction. And then where a male and female mate is called the definity host. So the alternate host in this particular parasite is in the mosquito. And the mosquito bites you and the uh, larva emerge from the mouth parts of the mosquito onto the skin and enter the wound from the bite. And the larva migrate to the lymphatic vessels and then to the nodes where they mature and a male and a female mate and uh, the, usually the male dies and the female remains in the um, lymph vessels and as she eats she gives off waste and noxious uh, chemicals that irritate the body and the body basically puts uh, something very much like a scab or um, what would you call it? Ooh, I don't want to say insist. It uh, makes like a callus around her because it's constantly irritated by her waist and what she gives off. And so uh, as the body is walling her off with this thick tissue around her, she loses food and gets trapped in her own waist and begins dying. And when she dies, the body completely walls her off to protect itself from all that dying, rotting protein and blocks the lymph drainage. Now, you have to get many of these worms blocking a lot of lymph drainage to get this edema that happens. And once you get the edema, there's nothing you can do about it. They've tried operating, doesn't do anything. They tried wrapping it in elastic bandages and pulling them really tight to try to force limp through. Doesn't do anything. And what it does do is it has poor circulation and they get secondary fungal and bacterial infections. So uh, that's generally what happens. Um, the female produces millions of little microfilaria that are picked up by biting mosquitoes in the peripheral blood. Now, what's different about Brugia malayi? The worms stay in the lungs during the day. And for some reason that we don't understand, they have a watch. And when it's sun up, they move to the peripheral blood. So they can be picked up by mosquitoes. Because mosquitoes bite from sun up to sun down. And then during the day, they rest in, under your bed or in the eaves. And they digest. They only bite at dawn and dusk. And so um, these particular parasites in Brugia malayi have this characteristic called periodicity, where they live in the lungs when mosquitoes aren't biting, and they move to the peripheral blood, that means the blood right under the skin, when mosquitoes are biting, and they, then they can be picked up and carried and perpetuate their life cycle. Um, Sorry, once or twice. Did you say that they're in the lungs overnight or in the middle of the day? <laughs> Between 10 and 4, they move to the peripheral. 10 p.m. to 4 a.m., uh, they migrate. 
So that's very unusual, but that's just particular uh, something particular to that particular to the the Borgia malayi. Yes. And are you saying that that the mosquitoes bite an infected human? They carry the the microfilaria. Microfilaria. Filaria. And then they pass it on to somebody else. Where did right. that person get it to begin with in the first place? Uh, one million years ago. Oh, it's just. They have evolved, and they've been here for hundreds of thousands of years. Like, can they get it like water? Because they're not bored with it, right? Just... No, no. I mean, it was in the mosquito. I mean, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Right. I'm just wondering if it bites an infected human, and then the that human So the it, this is an it, these parasites evolved with humans, you know, 100,000 years ago. All right. So um, let's go on and talk about how they hide. We're answering all these questions. Remember. The alternate host mosquito, the defending host is man. The vector, or how they get here, is various mosquitoes, Aedes, Culex, Anopheles, and Mansoni. All of the filarial diseases hide from the human immune system the same way. They produce enzymes that cut antibodies into pieces. So when your body makes antibodies, which usually takes 10 to 14 days, uh, those antibodies then move to attack the parasite. The parasite produces enzymes that cut the antibodies into pieces. So they don't work. Remember, lots of times antibodies coat foreign things and then that makes them uh, very delectable for macrophages to gobble up. And if they can't coat, then they're not going to be gobbled up. Remember, these are large parasites, so you would think your immune system could, be, could get rid of them. And the answer to why they don't, because the ones that evolve ways to get around the human immune system still exist, all the rest are extinct. All right, uh, which of the part of the parasite's life cycle is the most damaging to man? The adult female. She's the one that lays in these lymph vessels and eventually is walled off by fibrous tissue and eventually dies and then is further walled off, blocking the lymph flow. Uh, what potential do we have to control this? The potential to control it is not good. Uh, one, you have, we don't have, have any idea who's going to get it, who doesn't. In other words, who is going to react this way and get out big leg, and who is just going to have the circulating parasites. Only about 20% of the people that have the circulating parasites that have been bitten for 20 years get the big leg. We don't know what that, why that is. We can help protect the population from future infection by giving them a dewormer called ivermectin that puts the female worm on birth control. So if she doesn't produce microfilaria, then the mosquitoes don't pick it up and don't pass it on. But you have to treat the entire population. Uh, you can blood test people and give them a medic medications that will get rid of the microfilaria, but once the adult worms are there, you'd have to put them in the hospital to get rid of the adult worms and of course they can't afford forty dollars can they afford a hospital visit so uh, there's lots of bad news about this disease we just don't know enough about it to control things other than trying to block the vector the different kinds of mosquitoes um, you know we tried to control mosquitoes with pesticides and it didn't work well because we sprayed 2,4-D and 245T, and we almost wiped out mosquitoes, except that we didn't do it consistently, so they became immune to it, and then we discovered that 24D is, is perpetually in the environment. Once you create it, you can't get rid of it. So everyone in this room has it in their body fat, because when they decided to quit using it, they dumped thousands of pounds off of California into the ocean. Like if you can't see it, it doesn't exist, and of course, then it went into the fish, and you, it doesn't break down. So we don't know what 2,4-D does to human beings over 200 years exposure, which is why we banned it. We do know what it does to birds. It prevents their reproduction by making soft shells. So right now, what we're what's interesting is uh, the mosquitoes, several of the kinds that carry these parasites, were wiped out from the United States. They're back but they don't carry the parasites yet. 
if they do carry the parasites, there has been a proposal to reintroduce 2,4-D because now they're no longer immune to it because we haven't used it in 50 years. So there's all kinds of controversy on it. The, there is better ideas out there like what we're doing with fruit flies. Does everybody know what they do with fruit flies in California? Fruit flies would wipe out a lot of the crops in California. So they have traps all around the city, even in your own backyard, there are traps put up by the uh, California Department of Agriculture to trap and see if we get fruit flies that will ruin our citrus and other crops. And when they find them, they release millions of sterile males. See, the girls don't know the guys are sterile. And they still have hoochie with them. But there are no babies. So if we can get something like that up with the mosquitoes, maybe that might help. Or get a fungi that might destroy the mosquitoes, but then there's a problem with that. Every time we wipe out a species, we upset the balance. And we don't know what balance the mosquitoes are doing. Well, that's what I want to know. I mean, a lot of things obviously they do, but they eat less purpose mosquitoes. Yeah, we don't know. They are a major food source for things like lizards and other things around. So you may mess up something all the way up. All right, so let's move on. Any questions about elephantiasis? All right, the next one is one of the worst of all. It's called river blindness is the common name. The scientific name is onchocerciasis. And the microbe is Onchocerea bulbalis. Um, it is a filarial disease as well. And you'll notice that it goes from Brazil, Africa, Asia. Basically everything south of the equator. And uh, it is, we have had some tremendous success in West Africa only. Right here in West Africa, we've had tremendous success. And we're going to talk about it, but let's just go through the life cycle. It is carried by a biting black fly. And the reason it's called river blindness is this black fly can only, it makes little uh, cocoons on reeds in fast running water, river water. So the cocoon has to be kept moist by fast running river water of the simoleon fly. And only the simoleon fly, a biting black fly, about the size of an extra large house fly, um, only that carries this disease. Um, and the simoleon fly, if you're American, is spelled S-I-M-O-L-I-A-N, and if you're British, it's P-S-Y. So it's slightly different spelling depending on who wrote it. So you can see it as simoleon with P-S-Y or S-I-M. So this is the American spelling here. All right, so anyway, uh, the alternate host is the black fly. And when it bites, it uh, the microfilaria get into the skin and enter the body through the bite wound and they migrate to the subcutaneous tissue and they form big nodules. You can see the nodules like this. Lots of times they are right here above the crack of the hoo-hoo. And uh, they're under the arm. And there are hundreds of males and females laying there in a permanent spooning position, eating and having sex for the rest of their lives, for years, producing thousands of little microfilaria all the time. These microfilaria that they produce live one to two years. And then some trigger that we don't understand causes almost all of them to die at once. When they all die at once, that huge amount of dying protein in your circulating peripheral blood causes a massive immune response and inflammation that causes itching over every square inch of your body. People kill themselves because the itching goes on for three solid weeks. You itch every square inch of your body itches for three solid weeks, 24 hours a day. This happens every two years. And this is what it does to your skin with this repeated dying and itching and 
growing and repeating and so forth, it gives you what this super elastic, what they call elephant hide skin. But I haven't mentioned anything about anybody going blind or any problem. You see, when these microfilaria die, and when they're, when they're circulating, it's no problem. Except that when they bite somebody, they're picked up and carried on to someone else. But when they all die at once, each time they die in the capillaries of the eye, they cause microcalcifications. And over a 15-year period of this happening, every two years, for 15 years, people go blind. And so in these villages where it's endemic, everybody over the age of 16 is blind. So you see a, a what results from this is you have a huge population explosion where people have 20 kids. Why? Because every few years, everybody's blind, so they need another kid that can see, that can help run the family. And if you've seen picture, movies of people uh, in Africa, you'll see a whole family being led by a young person with a stick. And mommy's then, and daddy, and each of their brothers and sisters all holding on to a stick because the young person is taking them to the fields and the young person will put them down in the corn and show them the row, and they'll spend the day weeding. They're all blind. They can tell light from dark, but that's it. And so it's a tremendously difficult disease. And why, lots of people say, well, why don't they move away from the river? If you move away from the river, you move away from the simoleon plot. But remember, these areas of West Africa, up in the uh, sub-Saharan region, it's a jungle, but near the ocean, it's dry. And so the river is the only source of water to irrigate their cornfields. So they have to live near the river or they starve. If they live near the river, they're going to go blind. So the choice is really crappy. Um, what about what does... Well, remember, it hides from the immune system the same way all filarial diseases do by producing antibodies, I mean producing enzymes that cut antibodies. And the vector is the simoleon fly, it's the only one, a biting black fly. It hides, again as I said, by producing enzymes that cut antibodies. The divinity host is man, again, because they're the male and the female are in these nodules in a permanent spooning position, eating and having sex and producing microfilaria that die about every one to two years. So what causes the disease? The dying microfilaria. So that's the test question answer. What part of the microbe's life cycle is the most dangerous to man? It's the dying microfilaria. Not the fact that it's microfilaria, but that when they die, it causes the microcalcifications that build up over time. So what's the hope for control? Well, this is where there's been really wonderful success, but only in West Africa. And they did a two-pronged two approach. Yes? So if you just say microfilaria, then it's wrong. Enemies, dying it has to be dying microfilaria. Oh. Unless the only choice there is microfilaria, because you know if it, if the choice is adult female, egg, microfilaria, dog, it's not going to be anything but closest to correct is yeah, microfilaria. So it says none of this is correct, and you would just put the well, if it has microfilaria, that's the stage of the life cycle. So the best answer is dying. The second best is microfilaria. All right, so anyway, um, what has been done? Remember, again, you can't kill the, the adults without causing anaphylactic shock. So there's too much protein in these nodules of uh, male and female worms to kill them. You can't give it poison and then have all this worm material die inside a person without killing them. So that doesn't work unless you put them in the hospital and that you can't afford. So we have a really good story about this. Uh, a veterinarian in the United States was doing research on a common product that had been sold for many years in the United States, which by the way it's cheaper than dirt. And it's called ivermectin. And ivermectin is a cattle wormer or a pig wormer. 
in the United States. And so um, every year, my dad used to, have, my dad when he was alive had a cattle farm, and every August we do the roundup. Awful. Why in August when it's 110 degrees outside? But never mind. I never did get the logic behind that. But that anyway. One, the worms go crazy. Maybe it keeps him from uh, going, getting his nuts, the animals, because it's too hot. I don't know. But anyway, we round them all up, and we put them in a corral, and we push them through a chute. We cut the testicles off of the male and cut the horns off, and we give them all their vaccinations. And then while they're in the squeeze chute, when they're going, ah, ah, my job was to take this thing that looked like a caulking gun and shoot this whitish purple muck in the back of their throat where they couldn't spit it out and they would swallow it and it's ivermectin and the next day they would have a diarrhea attack that would expel all the worms and they would be wormless for a year. So it was a very cheap dewormer and he said if it works on large round worms like Ascaris and whipworms and round worms and cows, why wouldn't it work on microscopic round worms? So he wrote a letter to the company that owned the patent, Merck Sharp and Dome, to the president and said, why don't we see if it works on microscopic filarial worms, because this is a horrendous disease and there is nothing for it that can be used on a large population. And so Merck Sharp and Dome got together with Case Western Reserve and Liberia and they put together a trial in Liberia and what they just they used diethylcarbamazine as the um, drug that causes a lot of problems that you have to basically put people in the hospital to give them to kill the adults. And they used ivermectin. And what they discovered from this trial was that one ivermectin pill per year puts the adult female on birth control. So she doesn't make microfilaria. If she doesn't make microfilaria, then microfilaria don't die. If they don't die, they don't go blind. Now, it doesn't reverse any of the damage that's already been done. But if you treat people from early age every year, then they'll never go blind unless they miss their dosage. Uh, it doesn't do anything to the female, but basically it's a birth control pill for her. It doesn't kill her. She's still there, so it's not a cure. But it does prevent the damage, which is blindness. So Merck, if you looked at uh, this diagram, I hope there's a diagram here. I think there is. Somewhere here. You can't quite see it. But anyway, if you look at a diagram of Africa, the continent, you'll notice that it has more countries than any other continent on Earth, more countries in Africa. Each one of those countries has their own FDA. And remember, they have local languages and the colonial languages. So you've got all kinds of bureaucracy. If you want to sell drugs in Africa, can you realize the bureaucracy that you're going to have to do? You go to one, just one little area and it's seven countries, each one with their own bureaucracy and their own form of FDA for controlling and local languages and French and English and all of this. And so Merck said, maybe we can get more cooperation from these countries and get kind of a free pass if we give away this drug for free. After all, how much does it cost to make it? About $50 a ton. So they decided to give away ivermectin to any country that will monitor its distribution. Now, the, this is the problem that they have. If you know that this drug is going to stop people from going blind, and they put you in a room, and there are 20 tablets on the table, and they leave the room, what are you going to do? Because if it was me, I'd take three and steal five for my family, wouldn't you? All right, see, this is the problem. You have to regulate the dosage because what other weapon do we have? Nothing. When this quits working, there is no backup plan. There is nothing else. So Merck was very worried about 
abuse of the program of people taking more than the required dosage, that it might be toxic, they might get sued, or it might not work anymore, or getting less than the required dosage, or only the nice people getting it, and the poor people not getting it. And so they made it as part of their requirements that uh, any country that they gave the entire population, they're, they're willing to provide pills for the entire population, but trained people have to give it, and they have to actually they basically tell you to open your mouth, they give you the pill, they hand you a cup of water, and they watch you take it, and then you have to open your mouth, and they take a tongue depressor, and they look to make sure you swallowed it. Because throughout many places in the world, they have these rumors that Americans are trying to sterilize Muslims because of 9-11, and anytime there is free vaccinations or free drugs, they, re they may cooperate, but they spit it out or they try to avoid it. So, you know, do people prefer to believe good news or bad news? Bad news. They would rather believe the gossip and the conspiracy theory than the fact that they're trying to prevent an illness. So, anyway, this is wonderful what happened with ivermectin. Next, it wasn't enough. You still got to treat the vector, the black fly. And since it only grows in those fast-running rivers, they developed a onchocerciasis control program for West Africa where the WHO, World Health Organization, and the governments put together and bought at a very, the lowest price they could, the least damaging to the environment pesticides, and they regularly bombed the rivers with these pesticides to kill the simoleon fly. As a result, they have cleared 17 countries of this disease. Now, there's no cooperation in the Far East, and there's uh, Brazil is doing their own thing and getting rid of it, but there's a big problem in East Africa and the Far East because they have no joint program going where they're trying to attack it from two directions, getting rid of the vector, and using ivermectin. So there's a lot of hope for control of this, and there's a big success, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Any questions about oncocerciasis? Is this one not an alternate host because the, the black man, blood, uh, the fly. And then the, um, Definitive is man. Okay, the next one is heartworms in dogs and cats. It's mostly dogs, but it is moving to cats. Uh, the reason I put it up here is Lots of people think, well, these weird diseases are only in other parts of the world. This is North America. This is the Western Hemisphere. It's called Dirofilaria humedius. It originated in dogs. It's now moving in cats. It's carried by the same kinds of mosquitoes, various different kinds of mosquitoes that bite dogs. And what happens is the bite, the worms move to the uh, mature in the heart itself and they block the valves from closing. So the dog does not get oxygenated blood. It's always leaking the deoxygenated blood with the oxygenated blood. And so once a dog gets bitten several times by a mosquito, even at an early age, uh, within six to nine months, they'll develop these large worms inside the heart. And since it blocks the closing of the valves, a puppy can barely walk across a the room. They're exhausted, and they're doing this cough, like old people do when they can't get enough oxygen. You'll notice in, in old folks' homes, you'll hear them. <coughs> this is a reflex when you're not getting enough oxygen in your blood. So the definitive host is the mammal, the dog. The alternate host is several different kinds of mosquitoes. Uh, the treatment, you blood test, let me get through it, that you blood test uh, the animals soon after they're born and you begin treating with ivermectin, which you can put on the back of their skin once a month. It'll get rid of fleas and get rid of and prevent uh, this disease. Um, you can give it in their food on a daily basis. The only problem is, just like the previous disease, one bite by one mosquito when you're not protected and you've got it.
and you can't give the medication after they already have adult uh, worms because it will kill the animal. So uh, it's the problem is the medication cannot ever be missed. Uh, we don't have it in Southern California because we don't have mosquitoes. It's not wet enough uh, to have mosquitoes, but it's all over the Midwest, the South, Canada, and Mexico. Okay, what was your question? Um, I'm not quite following the alternate versus the definitive and asexual. Where do you have male and females mating is the definitive, and when the just the little uh, parasite itself reproduces is intermediate. Okay. So the parasite reproduces inside mosquitoes, the intermediate or asexual, and then the male and female worms uh, mate and produce microfilaria that are in the bloodstream that are picked up by the mosquitoes. Remember, most every one of these diseases, except for the last two, have two different hosts. They reproduce in both. One of them they reproduce sexually, and one of them asexually. Uh, so, again, they hide by producing enzymes that block or cut antibodies. And the adult female is the da damaging one. It blocks the valves. Adult female. They don't have a vaccine for dogs? Nope. Sadly. Okay, the next one is two diseases, American and African Loa Loa, or Loa Aces, and it's called the African and American Eye Worm. And in Africa, sadly, it overlaps with river blindness. So not only do they get to have the eye worm, they get river blindness, all the same, a lot of their uh, endemic area uh, overlaps. Um, this is carried by a biting deer fly, and in the United States, it's hunters in southern Canada, Minnesota, uh, those areas that get it. Um, you can be bitten just a couple of times, and it will circulate in the bloodstream, and in Africa, the worms grow in the capillaries around the whites of the eye. And you can get up to 10 in these capillaries and they can actually block the proper movement of the eye. And so they have to actually be extracted and removed. And if you pull out the uh, female worm, uh, you just fixed it for a temporary time because these people still have the circulating microfilaria that will grow up into more worms. So this is, has to be repeated. Uh, you can blood test for it and take ivermectin and prevent it, but you have to take it, you know, um, once a year like we were talking about before. So the treatment will treat both of the diseases at once. Um, in the United States, the way I came across it was really interesting, at least to me, it was freaky interesting. I went to college, I mean, I went to high school with a, a group of people named the Monteros that were from Minnesota. Now they talk funny up there. And uh, they worked for Singer Corporation, and after we all graduated and all this and everybody went away to college, one time I was driving through Minnesota and I called them up and said, gosh, it'd be great if we all got together and had dinner. So they said, yeah, that'd be great. Let's go to a fancy restaurant and have dinner. So we went to Denny's. <laughs> That's a fancy restaurant in northern Minnesota in farm country. And we're sitting at Denny's and looking across the table at John Montero and I'm sitting there, and the more I talk to him, the more I look. And, I, and right in the black area, the pupil of the eye, there's a white worm moving around. Hi, how are you? What you doing today? Oh, bye. Hi, Mary. Thank you. And I'm going. <laughs> and I can't keep up with the conversation because I'm staring at this worm that's waving at me. And finally, Marilyn says, I guess you see John's worm. And I said, what is that? And she said, it's Loa Loa. It's Loa Aces. He's a big deer hunter, 
and he got bitten by big old deer flies, they're like horse flies, out hunting, and it carries this parasite, but so few people get it, they don't think to take the blood test and get the ivermectin. And so, once you get it, you got it. And since it doesn't cause any real problem, there's nothing done about it because it's just in the pupil of your eye and it just lives there criticizing you. <laughs> all the time, you know, you're out on a date. Just kiss her. Just kiss her. What's wrong with you? You know, all these comments it's making. But other than causing a little bit of watering of the eye, um, it doesn't cause anything other than being ugly. And there's no reason to remove something and operate on the interior of the eye if it's not causing a problem. Yeah? It doesn't cause any inflammation problems? Because basically it's bacteria and it blocks No. Your brain compensates for the spot on the back of your eye. It'll compensate for a little worm. Your brain fills it in. You know, you've done that whole thing where you find the where the optic nerve attaches to the back of your retina and you, it's called your blind spot. No, it doesn't cause anything other than uh, watering of the eye and criticism. So it doesn't cause blindness? No, not the, not the American form. But the African one does? Yes. The African one can get all kinds of secondary infections. It doesn't involve the interior of the eye. It's the blood vessels around it, around the sclera. Okay, so uh, again, same old thing. Definitive host is man. The worms have sex and reproduce microfilaria that picked up by biting deer flies. In the biting deer fly, it does asexual reproduction. Um, it hides from the immune system by producing enzymes that cut antibodies. And the one that does the most damage is the adult female. Why do we keep saying female? Because the male is really small. So it's the female, female in most cases that does all this damage and block. And it does it by physically blocking or cause, uh, you know, the movement of the, what do you call it, the orbit of the eye? Does the female use the male? Nope. All right, and of course, ivermectin uh, can, if you get it, as soon as you get bitten, and you, uh, you can, or if you know you're going to get bitten, you can take the ivermectin and prevent it from uh, the microfilaria from being produced and passing it on, but once you get the adult, you got to physically remove it. Yeah? Okay, so like you said, you can remove the worm. Yeah, in the uh, African version, not the American. There's no reason to in the American. It causes no problem other than being ugly. <laughs> okay, so the next, that's the end of the filarial diseases. The next one is the guinea worm. And the guinea worm, we have it on here because one, it's a major success story, and two, it's the symbol of the medical profession. That staff that you thought had a snake on it was the symbol of the doctor. It's not. That's the first medical treatment ever recorded in history. And that is the winding up of a guinea worm on a stick is the very first medical treatment ever recorded. So uh, the name of the disease is dracunculiasis or dr dracunculiasis. Uh, the, it's called the fiery serpent in common language, um, or the guinea worm. And the life cycle, cycle is like this. Um, the eggs, we'll talk about how the eggs get into the water, but eggs enter the water from the worm. And little water fleas called cyclops, if you've ever looked at pond water, they look exactly like little lobsters, but they're clear. They're called water fleas or cyclops or uh, copepods. They gobble up the egg because they think it's food, except it doesn't digest. It insists in them. And when a person drinks water with those copepods in it, as soon as the copepod hits your stomach acid, it releases the larval stage. And the larval drill through your um, stomach and intestines and go right out to between the first and second layer of the skin. Male and female uh, develop, have sex, the male dies, and the female uh, eats basic your, your uh, blood serum and body fluids, and she moves down 
between the first and second layer of the skin and she can get as long as three feet long. And she moves down the leg and her preferential